Uh, if you're a guest here today, thanks so much for being here. We started a few months ago praying the Lord's Prayer at the beginning of every message. And I think it's important because Jesus said to his disciples, look, when y'all get together, pray like this. And we're, if you've never prayed the Lord's Prayer before, we have it on the screen. And this is the King James Version, in case you're wondering why it's not regular English. But uh, would you pray with me? Our Father, who art in heaven... Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, we just come to you this morning. We want to hear from you as we read your words in this book that you wrote for us. I just pray, Lord, that we all learn something today that's going to change us, that's going to make us stronger, it's, going, it's, going to, it's, it's just going to change the way we look at life, whether we're going through a hard time right now or whatever's going on, Lord. I just pray that today be the day that your word changes us and takes us to the next level. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a seat. Have a seat. I have been, if, if, like I said, if you're a guest, let me give you a couple things to know. You should have received a bulletin when you came in. That's that thing that's folded. It's got a little card that rips off. And uh, inside that are two different things. One of them is you get to take notes if you want to. There's fill in the blanks. And the other thing is um, all the scripture that I use is on that sheet of paper usually. Sometimes I'm missing one or missing two that I added later. And then the other one is either a study you can kind of do on your own uh, that goes with this message for today, or it's what our life groups use when, when they get together during the week. I'm, I'm calling today's message, Work Your Best for Jesus. I've been teaching through the book of Ephesians, and the Apostle Paul started this church about 30 years before this time, and he got the church rolling and going, and then he went and he got himself put in prison. So he now, 30 years later, is writing this letter to this church in Ephesus. By the way, it's pretty messed up. Uh, there's all kinds of evil things going on. There's all kinds of things that well, it's a lot like us today. Is that amazing? Can you imagine? We haven't fixed that in 2,000 years. So, so that, that's, that's what he's going through. And he's going, look, you're Christians living in a non-Christian world, so here's how you go about living your life. It's not about the way other people are treating you that are around you that you work with or whatever. It's about the way you represent God well in all situations. I always start off with three questions. Because it's so important that we, that we leave here today with something that we can take home, we can take to the office, that we can take anywhere and use. But here's the three questions. What point in this message is most impactful for you? How does it challenge, change, or affirm your thinking? And how will you put into practice what you learn today? That's my goal for you. I hope that all of you at one point in this message have an aha moment. And I will tell you this, since you'll be hearing the word of God and that I'm speaking on God's behalf and the Holy Spirit is speaking in God's behalf, you'll get that aha moment. If you'll just prepare yourself to listen and hear and, and, and God, God can change you, all right? So this part of the letter, Paul is writing about children and parenting children and how children should should act. And he's also writing about employees and employers. You'll see when we get there in a minute that the employees in here back in that day were slaves. And I'll give you a, a, I'll, I'll give you a little background on that when we get there. But the first thing is this that said to the children, honor your parents with your actions and attitude, attitude. I'll tell you what, I was one of those kids that I would do it, but I would have the wrong attitude. You know what I'm saying? It was just obvious that I didn't feel like I wanted to be doing this, but I'm doing it anyway. And one time I ran right over the swing set. 
It was horrible with the lawnmower. So, so that was a bad attitude. Honor your parents with your actions and attitude. We never used that swing set again. It was ruined. It was destroyed. And my dad whooped me when he got home. It was so good. So here we go. Children, Ephesians 6, 1. Children, obey your parents because you belong to who? You belong to who? The Lord. The Lord. You belong to the Lord above belonging to your parents. Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. For this is what, say with me, the right thing to do. The right thing to do. Now, I want to tell you something. Some of us had screwed up parents. Some of us had no parents. Some of us had parents that were, to this day, we're glad that we, we, we were raised in that family. But the bottom line is, our role as children is to obey our parents. It's to obey our parents. The word for obey here is the word that stands for stand under, stand under. Proverbs is probably the most helpful book on child raising ever written. By the way, if you've never read through the book of Proverbs, that's in the Old Testament. Guess how many chapters are in the book of Proverbs? Help me out. 30 or 31. Is it 31? Yeah. Well, I added three more. So in my Bible, it's 34. <laughs> but, but no, the cool thing about Proverbs is that, you know, it's, about, it's like this long, and, and you can get up and read it every day, and the wisdom that you will pick up from that. And, and I'm just, this is extra, okay? You don't have to pay for this part. Before you read Proverbs, you get up in the morning, and you go, Lord, thank you so much for your word. Forgive me for the things that I've done wrong. And Lord, would you teach me what I need to know from these verses? And da-da, that's what the Holy Spirit does. That's what the Holy Spirit does, is he, he helps you to learn. Um, a lot of the theme in the, in the Proverbs is, is on children and how they have to learn. And, and, and the most important lesson that a child learns in the book of Proverbs is to be obedient. I said, it's to be obedient. I didn't hear, I heard one parent say amen. It's to be obedient. Golly, give me a break, come on. Look, what, uh, look at Ephesians 6, 2, and 3. Ephesians, Ephesians. Ephesians 6, 2, and 3. You ready? Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you, and you will have a long life on earth. You'll have an easier life. You'll, and I don't mean easy as in it's not going to be hard. I mean the blessing that you will get from God when you honor your parents is, is very powerful. So, so Paul is talking to children from childhood to adulthood, and to parents, it's our job, number one goal for a Christian parent is to teach your kids to follow Christ. Number one goal. And that ought to start early, you know. You ought to give them little Jesus suckers when they're babies and all those kind of things. You've, you've got to kind of build that up. As parents, it's our job to raise our kids in the Lord so that they will be obedient and Christ-like and successful adults. Now, let me read something that I just came across this on Instagram this week. There's been multiple studies done where they've shown that children who do chores, there was, there was nothing else in this study. There were children who do chores, develop a variety of skills that make them successful later in life. Self-esteem. Children who grow up doing chores end up with better self-esteem. Responsibility, the ability to uh, take on problems and, and, and get things done without even being asked. Time management. You're thinking, my kid doesn't know time management. No, I'm talking about, I'm talking about the adults. I'm talking about the adults that have gotten there from childhood where, where their parents... <sighs> I'm just going gonna, gonna to take a poll. How many guys in here had to wash the dishes? Look at that. Successful, 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 successful. 
problem solver, problem solver, problem solver. There you go. There you go. See, that's what I told you. I told you. Uh, organizational skills, problem solving, solving, work ethic, empathy. Man, I could feel for people who did dishes. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I just hated it. I, look, never mind. Go ahead. Happiness. Children who do chores are happier in their adult life. Someday, some say that children should be involved in age-appropriate chores by what age? What age? You know, pick up your toys. You know, pick up your toys. Exodus twenty twelve. Honor your father and mother, then you will live a long, full life in the land of the Lord your God is giving you. Next thing. Godly parents, godly parenting does not guarantee godly kids. Some of you may be sitting here today and go, I did everything but shove the Bible down my kid's throat. And not a godly kid. Or... My kid went through a problem, and then when they got a little bit older, here's what I found as I've counseled people, and, and I know from, from, from my life, and um, you can church a kid, church a kid, live your life around them like you're supposed to, teach them to love Jesus, and there comes a point where they just feel like they've got to get out on their own. And about the time they get ready to start having kids, they often come back. They often come back. It's interesting. Uh, Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from what? That comes from the Lord. Now, I'm, I'm just telling you, the Lord doesn't ask us to do easy things all the time. A lot of the things we learn are... Are, uh, are, are really hard. But again, those are the things that make us stronger and, and more successful in life. The word that's used here for anger is not the common word that describes irritation or, or temporary upset. The word used here means anger which results in rebellion. Fathers, don't provoke your children to the place where they completely lose control and break out against authority. There are two things which cause rebellion in a child. You might want to write this one down. Two things that cause rebellion in a child. One is harshness. Did you guess that one? Harshness. The second one is indulgence or pampering. We think the best thing there is to pamper our kid, and that can actually be the thing that makes them break away. It's just, again, they're not learning that responsibility. Indulgence and harshness. Proverbs 22, 6. Direct your children in the right path, and when they are older, say it with me, they will not leave. Now, a Christian parent's goal is to lead the child into being a successful, Jesus-following adult. Our kids and grandkids need to see us being disciples. But we can't be dragging them to church and teaching them and being one. I can't tell you how many, I can't tell you how many times I've had a young adult or even an older person sit in my counseling office and go, you know, my dad was the elder at the church and everybody thought he was the greatest person in the world, but he was terrible at home. He didn't do anything that he taught. He treated us horribly. You want to mess up a kid? then act like you're a believer at church and don't act like one when you're at home. It'll mess them up every single time. It's interesting because when we, when we were uh, early on in our church and, and my kids and grandkids, they, they go to our church. And uh, uh, one night we had a guest come and, and I was talking about family and I don't remember exactly what the topic was, but this young man walked up the aisle when we got through, and he came up to me, and he had just tears in his eyes. He was almost, he was almost heave boo hooing and his dad is a pastor. Well, obviously, his dad wasn't the kind of person that a pastor is supposed to be at home. 
He was different at church. He said to me, I can't believe your kids go to your church. You know why? Because at 25 years old, I realized it's my responsibility to teach my kids how to live their life. And I can't be one way at church and another way at home. Completely different. Completely different. It'll mess a kid up bad. A Christian parent's goal is to lead a child into being a successful follower of Jesus. Next one. Often there are second chances. Often there are second chances. Like I said, you can raise your kid up pretty darn good and, and still have them get to the point where they get to college and, and um, you know, all of, us, all of us rebelled a little bit, right? We, right? When, when, when I was a kid, we couldn't wait to 18. You know why? Because that was our drinking age when we got to 18, you know. And then even before that, we would sneak off when we were 16. And, and never mind, I won't go into that story. But, but, but we, we <laughs> I totally forgot. I, so I was out there, out there. And uh, there's a story in the Gospels where Jesus um, talks about a young man uh, who was a younger brother in his father's house. And one day, apparently his father was pretty rich. One day his father, he came to his father and said, look, I don't want to, I don't want to live here anymore. I want my inheritance and I want it now. I'm going to go out and I'm going to wine women and song, all that kind of, you know, I'm just going to go. You, you did that, didn't you? You did that. I want my inheritance. And Stacy went here, you know, I mean, so so this kid runs off on his own. Now, his father's brought him up, and he's brought him up in a Christian, God-following home, and, but the kid still decides that, that he's going to rebel, and he's going he's to go out and do his things on his own. So, so he goes out, and he just starts spending the money and, and doing the things he shouldn't be doing, all the things that he was taught he wasn't supposed to do when he was a kid, when he was growing up in that family. And, and one day, he found himself in a hog's pen, a pig pen, eating the food of pigs. We went to the fair Thursday. <laughs> Have you ever gotten next to that big old giant fat hog? The, the big giant one that just lays there? That is the smelliest thing. I'm thinking, dude, what do you eat? Well, this kid, this young man ate, ate what the hogs were eating. And finally, he came to his senses. Thank God he comes to his senses. And that happens with our kids a lot. All of a sudden, he comes to his senses and he goes, I have done my dad wrong. Did I put that scripture in here? Oh, verse 17, Luke 15, 17. Go there. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying with hunger. Verse 18, 19. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So you can leave, and life can get so bad that you can go, my dad's servants have it way better than I have. I'm not even going to go back and ask to be his kid again. I'm going to go back and just ask to be his servant. Now, an amazing thing happened. As he's going, he's thinking, what am I going to say to my dad? Do I tell him the things that I've done? Do I tell him why I smell so bad? Do you, you know, how, how, how is this going to go down? And an amazing thing happened. As the kid got to where the father could see him at a distance, now the father never ran after him until he saw him coming back. And the father didn't sit there and go, oh, here he comes. Get ready. He ran to the kid. Isn't that amazing? See, I don't know if y'all know this, but sometimes Christians stop acting like Christians. Have y'all known anybody? 
sometimes, all of a sudden, they're just not, I'm just not going to do that anymore. I'm just, you know, I'll, I'll live my life out, and, and life, will be, life will be better. And then, and then when I'm close enough to maybe die, and then, then, then I'll go back and do what God wants me to be. Well, well, here's what happened. God doesn't chase you when you run off. But as soon as you make a U-turn, he runs to you. Isn't that amazing? That's the way God is. And that's the way we should be with our kids. We, 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 I talk to so many parents that are completely all the time bailing their kids out and bailing their kids out and bailing their kids out. Start praying for your kid to come back and let the kid come back to you. So that's, that's the part about raising kids. Did I encourage anybody? Did I scare anybody? Here we go. Here's the next thing. Represent as the boss and as the employee. Represent Jesus as the boss and the employee. First thing on there is employee, your real boss is Jesus. Now, you, if, you're, if your boss is a Christian and he's not acting like Jesus, don't go up to him and say, hey, why aren't you acting like Jesus? <laughs> He's already not in a good mood. He's already in a bad, he's already in a bad place. But the Apostle Paul begins this section with the word slaves. And, and people ask, well, did Christians have slaves back then and all? And, and I did a little research on that. So I'm going to read this to you word for word. In the first century, with the relationship was that of slave and master. At the time the apostle wrote this letter, it's been estimated that one half of the Roman population were slaves, and many of them were Christians, one half of the Roman population. The Christian message did not come first to the upper or higher classes. It came among the working people and even among slaves. Many of these slaves were highly educated people who had been captured in the war and brought to other parts of the empire and made slaves. They were not unintelligent, but they were slaves, literally in bondage to others. It was among these that the Christian message came first. So people are look, look at this and go, well, no, that what he really means is employees. They just, they just put the wrong word in there for slaves. No, it was, it was, it, they were slaves. They were literally slaves. That, that means their job was probably way worse than your job. I can't say that for everybody because I know some of our jobs stink sometimes. But, but that, that's the way it is. Slaves or employees is what we'll use now because I don't know. Do y'all have any slaves? I don't think we have any slaves. Obey your earthly masters. Now listen. With deep respect. If you're scared of somebody, you're going to obey them, but not with deep respect. You will have an attitude. And we're supposed to love our bosses, love our bosses, and give them deep respect. That's if you're a Christian. Now, if you're not a Christian, you can do whatever you want to. It won't go well for you. But if you're a Christian, we love our bosses with deep respect and fear. Serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. Now, I want to tell you something. When you start looking at your boss that way, when you start looking at your fellow employees that way, when you start looking at the, the ones that everybody doesn't like because of the way they act, if you start treating them the way God wants you to treat them, God is saying you love them, you honor them, you respect them, and you do your job better than anybody else there because we want them to respect us, not because of our pride, because we're a person of influence. You may not think you're a leader, whatever job you have, but leadership is influence, and your job is to be influencing people toward Jesus. And how do you do that? You act like Jesus wants you to act. You respect Jesus, and then you respect others. It's life-changing. It can turn things around instantly. I told you all my story. I mean, I'm, 
I committed my life to Jesus at 25. And at first, the guys in the room gave me a hard time. I was a clerk, didn't make a whole lot of money, had all these guys that I worked with. And, and as soon as I started acting like I should, boy, they gave me a hard time. And I think a lot of people would have quit. But God, God was in me so hard that when they did that, I just thought, you know, God, that's just what they think, and I'm okay with that, and I'm just going to do the best that I can. And then within a matter of weeks, they were coming to me for advice. I'm just a clerk, you know? I just got through reading meters, and now I've got promoted up to clerk, and they're coming and asking me for advice. Why? Because I was influencing them in the way that I should as a follower of Christ. Ephesians 6, 6. Try to please them all the time, not just when they are watching you. As slaves of Christ, do the will of God with all your heart. Next thing, work for Jesus. Work for Jesus. Verse 7, work with enthusiasm as though you're working for the Lord rather than for people. Let me say that again. Work with enthusiasm as though you're working for the Lord rather than for people. Christians never work for men. We work for God. Now, it'll come across as working for men, but we're going to do it so much better than everybody else because we're honoring God with what we do. You can work under a man's instruction, but remember that you're working for Jesus, that your daily task is to work and do the things that Jesus has given us to do in that situation that we're in, this worship with your work attitude is so important. Remember, whatever your job is, you are a leader. You're a person of influence. And if you're around any people at all, you're a leader, not that you tell them what to do, but that you show them what it is to live for Christ. If you approach work like it's boring to you, start working for Jesus. I'm just telling you, I'm not kidding you. If, if you think your job is boring, if you think, wish you weren't here, if you think you should have already gotten that promotion, if, 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 you're, if you're struggling with that, you got to realize that when you're working for Jesus, he's going to give you peace and joy and the sense of being in God's presence throughout the day. Verse 8, remember that the Lord will reward each one of us for the good we do, whether we are slaves or free. Let me say it again. Remember that the Lord will reward each one of us for the good that we do, whether we are slaves or free. Next thing, work with joy. Work for, with joy. Can I just... I'm not going to raise hands. I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands. But it's possible that somebody in here hates Mondays. I'm just, and if you work nights, you hate Monday nights. You know, I mean, I mean, we've got our time off and it's time to go. I just hate Mondays. If you work for Jesus, you should never hate Mondays. Do you agree? And it will make your job so much better. You'll get bored with being at home because you're not getting an opportunity to influence other people for Jesus. You know, my calling first was to be 11th grade boys Sunday school. My second calling was to go back to school and become a Christian therapist. My third calling was to become a pastor. Those are my callings. And my job's a little bit different than yours. My job is to help you become who God wants you to be. Your calling is whatever place you work at today, whatever desk that you've got, that's your calling. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you believe in a call, don't say, God's never called me to do anything. Yes, he did. He gave you that job. And if you lose that job, he'll give you another job. And that's your calling. And, and here's the amazing thing. I knew when I went back as a clerk and answered my calling to be who God wanted me be in the office, I had no clue that one day he was going to make me a pastor or a Christian counselor or even make me go back to school. But he did. So you don't know what's going to happen. 
And you know what? God may have just given you a job that you're in a perfect place to be there for 20 years and influence the people that are around you. No matter what your position is, you'll influence up, you'll influence sideways, and you'll influence down. That's the way it works. That's what God does. That's what's so amazing about having that responsibility that comes with being who God wants us to be. Next thing there is work for what God will do for you and with you. Work for what God will do for you and with you. When you get ready to go to work in the morning, when you're sitting in the parking lot, you pray, okay, God, who am I going to influence today? Who am I going to help be better today? And it'll make you better. Be a leader. Use your power and position to serve others. Use your power and position to serve others. And then look at verse 9. Masters, employers, treat your slaves, employees, in the same way. Don't threaten them. Remember, you both have the same master in heaven, and he has no favorites. We're really working for Jesus. I don't know if any of you have ever read the book Good to Great by, by Jim Collins, but uh, he, he gives different levels of leadership and the power that gets there. And the, and the level number five is the highest level of leadership you get, and most people never, ever get there whether they're in the business world as an executive of some XYZ gigantic company, they may never, ever, ever get to level five. You can get to level five before you leave here today by making a commitment to being who God wants you to be. You can change. Here's, here's what a level five leader is. You ready? An individual who blends extreme personal humility with intense professional will. Isn't that amazing? You can be a clerk and do that. You can be a garbage collector and do that. You can be anybody in any position and do that because you've got the help of the Holy Spirit. You've got God teaching you and, and helping you get to that level. And then I love this last verse, 2 Corinthians 12, 16, 9. The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Do you want to feel stronger? Do you want peace? Do you want joy? Do you want to be smarter? Do you want wisdom? God's looking for the people who are following him to give those gifts, to change your life. The easiest way to make this work is to love Jesus above all else. As a child, as a parent, as an employee, as an employer, honor Jesus. Hang out with Jesus. Have joy in Jesus. Now I'm going to touch on something else just a little bit. As Christians, our job is to interact with the rest of the world. If you live in Eulis, your job is to interact with the people of Eulis, the people in your neighborhood. As you, as you go out farther, we have civic duties that we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be a part of, of the economy, a part of helping people, a part of being everything that God wants us to be in our community and in our world. Civic duties. We're to pay our taxes. Jesus was asked, hey, how, how do I know? Should I pay, should I pay my taxes? Because He's talking to a guy who's giving to the church, and he's going, should I, should I pay my taxes? And Jesus said, hey, look at that coin. Whose picture is on that? And of course, it was the, it was the emperor. It was the king. It was the, so Jesus said, you pay your taxes. You do your civic duties. Now, I'm going to read something to you that just kind of blew me away. I heard it, and I went and looked it up, and, and, and it happened four years ago, and it's happening now. Four years ago, 40 million Christians did not vote. 
These are people who go to church on a regular basis. And whatever their reasons were, they're horrible people, they're whatever, and they just, they just didn't vote. So 40 million people that think like us, whoever your candidate is, didn't vote. So I thought, wow. So I looked up, how many Christians are not going to vote this? Don't you just love it that you can just, you know, how many Christians are not going to vote this, this time around? A new study by a researcher at Arizona Christian University says 32 million Christians who are regular churchgoers are likely to stay home this election. I don't do politics, and I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. But educate yourself, and you vote for the person that represents you the best. That's a whole lot of people to be taken out of the voting. You know what I'm saying? So I'm just leaving you with that. I'm not going to talk politics with you. I'm not going to talk anything like that. I'm just telling, as a Christian, just like you're supposed to pay your taxes, you're supposed to vote. And I would say vote for the city council and everything else. That's a responsibility that we have. Would you pray with me? Lord, I pray that we worship you with our lives, that we leave here today and we worship you in our neighborhood, we worship you uh, on our jobs, we worship you when we're at the store, we worship you with our lives in everything that we do. And Lord, I just pray for those in here today who may not know Jesus personally. Lord, I just pray that they can give their life to you today. And it's not just about going to heaven. It's about having joy. It's about having wisdom. It's about having strength. It's about part of being a community that will encourage you and build you up and help you be the best person that you can possibly be. I pray that today that decision be made. Just pray something like this. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Forgive me for my sins, and I want to live for Jesus the best way I know how for the rest of my life. And I thank you for what Jesus did for me in Jesus' name. Lord, would you help us to make our decisions based on what you want us to do, that we represent you at the office, that we represent you in our families. Lord, I pray that there's no adult here that acts like a Christian at church, but acts like a heathen at home. I pray that we follow you in front of our kids, in front of our friends, in front of people who need to know what it's like to be a true follower of Jesus Christ. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.